Thank you, praise the worship team. You may be seated. His love changes everything. Amen? Has it changed you? That's right. Okay, at this time we want to dismiss the Sunday school children. I think it's 11 and younger. Is that right? 11 down? Good. They're dismissed and... Uh, we want to give the time over to Pastor Ruben. Let's give him a welcome. Good morning, everyone. So good to be with you. I uh, thank Pastor Harvey for entrusting his pulpit to me, first of all. But secondly, more than that, if you're a part of the Fountain of Life Church, and uh, especially Pastor Harvey and his family, we just so much appreciate the opportunity to come down and have this three-week Bible school here in Belize, and uh, we just thank you so much for the warm welcome and all the work and effort and everything that's gone into uh, making this school happen, and uh, we just immensely appreciate that. So if we could at least have our, our students here as much as you can and give them a thank you by uh, sh uh, clapping your hands. <clears throat> In uh, Operation Metamorphosis Week 1, uh, typically there's a heavy dealing of the Lord with the hearts of the people as God brings uh, the school into kingdom alignment and brings the people into kingdom alignment, and we've been experiencing that the past week. And uh, then Week 2 is a week that's probably going to be a little more focused on deliverance, and I'm going to begin to take uh, people through some corporate deliverance. We have some evening sessions and uh, each night next week, and you're sure welcome to come out and join us with that. So that's a little bit my reason for choosing the subject that I've chosen this morning, which is an interesting topic. But if you have your Bibles, go with me to uh, Mark chapter 16, Mark chapter 16. And uh, many of you know that Mark 16 is where Jesus gives the great commission to his disciples. But it's a little bit different than the other great commissions that we can read about in Matthew and in Luke. He says some things here that he doesn't say in uh, some of the other uh, great commissions. And it's also interesting that uh, because of that, this passage of Scripture is controversial. Some of the newer versions even leave some of these verses out. And so that's an interesting to think about. Uh, but I believe that uh, concerning this subject of uh, God's Spirit, the supernatural, deliverance, uh, I believe it's something that God wants His modern-day church moving in and operating in. So I just asked Pastor Harvey, is it okay if I speak on that this morning? Are you guys okay with that? And he said, we are in the continuous camp. That wasn't the words he used, but he left me know, yes, he is okay with that. So uh, there's basically two groups of people in the body of Christ today. We have a group called cessationists, and that makes up the majority of the body of Christ, at least in uh, North America. And cessationists believe that there are certain parts of the uh, New Testament giftings and anointings that stop working after the church got the ball rolling, so to speak. Well, the problem with taking that position is there is absolutely not one verse of Scripture that would support that in any way, form, or shape. And so I am what they call a continualist. I believe the gifts of the Spirit continue right on through church history until that which is perfect is come. Who's that? Jesus. And he hadn't come back yet. 
And so until he comes back, God wants his church working in supernatural and divine authority and power. Can you say amen this morning? Okay. So let's see what Jesus said about this. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel. That's the great commission, right? And then in in verse 16, he said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. Then in verse 17, he says these words, these signs will follow those that believe. How many believers have we got here this morning? Now, believers are not supposed to follow signs and wonders. Amen. Signs and wonders are supposed to follow believers. A slight difference there. The uh, uh, Brother Charlie Watts is the speaker that's speaking in tonight's service, and he's a good friend of mine, and we come from the Kansas City area. I'm about an hour from there. He's up closer into the Kansas City area. But it's a hotbed of all kinds of charismatic and Pentecostal theology, and I appreciate this brother so much because he's solid in the Word and solid in what he believes, and he's not gotten hung up with following after every sign and wonder and latest trend in the charismatic church. Amen. (laughs) Or oh me. (laughs) There's winds of doctrines in every circles, and we need to keep our focus on Jesus. And as we become more intimate with him and we believe his word and we obey and be led by the spirit, then signs and wonders follow us. What's the first sign that Jesus said would follow a believer? In my name, they're going to do what? Cast out demons, cast out devils. First sign that should be following believers. Yet many churches want nothing to do with this today. The Assemblies of God, which is supposed to be a full gospel denomination, have decided they're not going to tolerate it in their church services anymore. Yet Jesus tolerated it in his church services. This was a big part of his ministry. So let me keep reading here. These signs shall follow those that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. That's supernatural too. So we have divine supernatural authority, first of all. Divine supernatural gifts and languages that are given to God's people. And then in uh, verse 18, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. That's divine supernatural authority. Protection. Everybody say protection. We are protected by the blood of Jesus. We are protected by angels. And then the last thing it says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's divine, supernatural healing power that God has made available to his church. Now in verse 19 he says, so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven sat at the right hand of God. And verse 20, I believe, is probably one of my top favorite verses in all of the Bible. Tell that person beside you, this is what you want. This is what I want. Amen. It says, they went out and preached where? Everywhere, right? And what happened when they went out and preached everywhere? It says, the Lord started working with them. How many of you would like the Lord to work with you? I want the Lord to work with me. The Lord working with them, and this is how he worked with them. Now notice it was them going, them preaching that initiated this. People say, well, we're not seeing a move of God anymore. Have you ever thought about going out and preaching everywhere? That's one of the things that's going to be needed. And as they went out to preach everywhere, the Lord was working with them, confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Those signs that we read about that would follow believers. And the first one being, in my name they shall cast out devils. My message is very simple this morning. Simply entitled, they shall 
cast out devils. Who is they? Who is they? What qualifies us to cast out demons? There's basically three things that you need if you want to walk in deliverance for yourself and for others. I believe we have the ability to self-deliver ourselves. Now, there's times you might need some help. But uh, there's times you might actually have to humble yourself and confess your sins to your brother or sister to get that help. But at the same time, we have authority, we have power, and so the first thing that we need if we want to cast out devils is we need faith in the name of Jesus. He said, in my name they shall cast out devils. First thing you need. The second thing you need is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, how did Jesus cast out devils? Well, a lot of people think he did it because he was God and he had authority over devils. Wrong answer. Now, Jesus was God, always will be God, but Jesus said this. Listen to these words in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. But if I cast out devils by what? The Spirit of God. So Jesus utilized the power of the Holy Spirit. In another place, he says, by the finger of God, I cast out demons. I cast out devils. So Jesus used the Holy Spirit. You know, there's trends. For those that are in heavy into deliverance today, there's some trends in the states I want to caution you on. And that's where they're no longer using the Holy Spirit, but information from demons to cast out demons. You don't need to talk to demons to cast out demons. Well, the one thing you probably need to learn to say is come out in Jesus' name. And so I don't talk to demons. I don't interrogate demons. I just tell them to leave. And if I need information when they won't leave, I get that from the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a safe place if you're going to move heavily into deliverance because I've seen some really good people uh, get caught up in interrogating demons and really get off track. And so one of the things I want to do is I want to throw out some cautions in this. Another caution I want to say is let's not become demon-focused. We keep our eyes on Jesus. Demons are real, and they are the cause of all of our problems. But the Bible says magnify your problems. Is that what it says? says, magnify who? Magnify the Lord. And so we magnify the Lord, and he gives us authority over our problems. And so three things are needed if you're going to cast out devils. Faith in the name of Jesus, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, I recommend you get saved because that's one of the ways to tap into that anointing. And then you get filled with the Holy Spirit. You receive power. You're endued with power from on high. And then the other thing is to be under... The authority of Jesus, it says in James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and then he will flee from you. So it's very important for you to be submitted to God before you go casting out devils. Make sure you're in kingdom alignment. Make sure you're submitted to the authority of Christ. Make sure you're under a good church covering. And uh, I want to just say this, that There's a story in the Bible, and a lot of people use this to scare people out of casting out demons, and I'm not going to use it that way this morning. But the seven sons of Sceva tried casting a demon out, and the demon said, Paul I know, Jesus I know, but I never heard of you guys. And so the reason the demon had never heard of these guys was because they weren't born again. They were sons of Sceva instead of sons of God. Now, how many sons of Sceva have we got in here this morning? How many sons and daughters of God have we got in here this morning? That qualifies you to cast out demons. That qualifies you to utilize the tools, the weapons of our warfare, which the Bible says is mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. You keep reading there, lots of people get caught up in the stronghold over Spanish Lookout or the stronghold over Belize or the stronghold over the United States. But you keep reading that, it tells you where the stronghold is. Where is it at? In our imagination, in our thoughts, in our mind, will, and emotions. 
In the realm of the soul is where the strongholds are. And so there's a difference between demons and strongholds, but demons are what create the strongholds. Strongholds are a way of thinking that's been caused by a demon. And so you can cast the demon out, but still have that way of thinking, and that's where we need the washing of the water by the Word and discipleship. Amen. That's a lost word in the church today. So we've moved away from so many of these things that the Lord wants to bring His church back to because it's part of what He's going to do before Jesus returns. He's going to prepare a bride that's glorious, that's moving in power, that's moving in the gifts, that's moving in revival. And God wants this church right here at Fountain of Life and these students at Operation Metamorphosis to be a part of that glorious bride. And so He's reestablishing some of these things. Now, there was a Pentecostal preacher who told me uh, some time ago, he said, you know, in my years of preaching, I've cast out demons. He said, I did it three times. And uh, this is over maybe 20 years of preaching the gospel. And he says, I just don't think that uh, we need to be casting out demons a lot. It might happen once in a while. And he said, I just don't see Jesus casting out demons all the time. I said, what? <laughs> and so I went back to my, I didn't get into an argument with him because you shouldn't do that if you're a Christian. I was waiting for that one amen I got. Maybe I ought to say that again. You shouldn't get into arguments if you're a Christian. <laughs> amen. Truth can stand on its own two feet. It can. And sometimes when we back down, the Holy Ghost will kick in. So I went back and I decided to check out my Bible, make sure I was right. And from the studies I have done, one third of Jesus' ministry was focused on casting out devils. I mean, he did it just pretty much all the time. First, he would minister the word. The washing of the water by the word. He would establish truth. And this is so important. You can go after demons here and demons there and demons here and demons there. But if you don't establish truth, the demons will come right back. And so we establish truth. But then Jesus would take time to minister and he would heal the sick. And the Bible says he would cast out unclean spirits, right? Unclean spirits. And now all of a sudden... Uh, 2,000 years later, there's none around anymore. We don't have to do that anymore, right? Wrong. They're still around. We've just given them other names, nicer names. Until five years ago, when revival hit our circles... I would have said the same thing as that Pentecostal brother. I'd have said, well, once in a while, once or twice in 15 years of ministry, we saw demons come out where we had a manifestation and got someone delivered. But all of a sudden, it's become a regular part of our ministry. Just the other night in the prayer lines, there were demons coming out. I don't go looking for them, but when they show up, the Bible says they shall cast out devils. It's a part of the job of the church. And uh, I've asked this question, what changed in the last five years? When revival hit us, the presence of God began increasing. The anointing of the Spirit began increasing in our circles. And that has a tendency to bring demons to the surface. You know, Jesus walked into a synagogue. And from all appearances, there was a man that attended that synagogue on a regular basis. A grown man that grew up Jewish and probably had been going there for years. But when Jesus walked into that synagogue, for the first time ever that we can read about in the Bible... Demons started manifesting. It was the presence of Jesus that caused it. And may I say this, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you walk in intimacy with him, 
the more the kingdom of darkness will be threatened by you. And it causes at times things to surface, and you don't need to be afraid of that. I'm sharing this message this morning not to put fear in you, not to cause you to get demon-focused, but I want you to see what the Word of God has to say about this. We have authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. We have authority to do that. And the Lord began using me in this a long time before I became perfect. I haven't got there yet, and he's still using me in this. And so it's faith in the name of Jesus, reliance upon the Holy Spirit, and submission to kingdom authority that puts you in a position where you have authority to cast out devils. Just the other day before I come down here, somebody called me from our local community, from a very uh, religious and conservative background. They didn't call their preacher. They called me. I wonder why they called me. Well, they said our preacher doesn't believe in this stuff. And uh, I went over to their house, and the person couldn't walk anymore, couldn't sit comfortably anymore because... There was some kind of growth tumor that was growing out of her body. And uh, on my way over, I began to pray about this situation. And the Lord said, there's a generational iniquity in that family line. And uh, I want you to ask her to repent of that on behalf of herself and previous generations. And I thought it was kind of interesting, so I presented that to this person, and immediately she responded and said, yes, so-and-so in my family line dealt with this sin, and so-and-so dealt with this sin, and yes, I'll take responsibility and repent of that. All I had was a word of knowledge. And so I just led her in a prayer, renouncing that simple prayer, and we prayed for her and blessed her, and we went home. And next morning, we got a phone call. And here somewhere through the night, I usually don't work quite this fast, but somewhere in the middle of the night, that tumor began to shrink. And by morning, it was down to almost nothing, and all the pain had left. That's amazing. Give the Lord a hand clap. That's the power of God. Identifying an open door. I want to talk about some open doors here today if I get to it can open the doors to demons, and one of the things we need to do through repentance is close the doors. Don't become demon-focused, but when the Lord deals with you about things in your life, be quick to repent. Be quick to forgive. Unforgiveness is one of the biggest open doors. Unforgiveness and bitterness is one of the biggest open doors to demons. Jesus himself says, if you won't forgive, I'm going to turn you over to the tormentors in that parable. We can read about. So forgiveness is so important if you want to stay free from the powers of darkness and tormenting spirits. The Bible says, fear hath torment. The Bible says that God has not given us the spirit of fear. It's a spirit. And it does not have to dominate you. Fear of man is a spirit. It does not have to control you. We need the fear of God. Can you say Amen. We need the fear of God back in the modern day church. By the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Now it's not us being afraid of God, it's a holy reverence where we love Him so much we're afraid to grieve Him. The fear of God. By the fear of God, the Bible says men will depart from evil. God wants to restore the fear of God to this generation. It's one of my number one prayers for these, this student body at Operation Metamorphosis. If you don't get anything else in the next three weeks, if you get the fear of the Lord, your life will be radically transformed. Now, <clears throat> most churches, most pastors want nothing to do with this. They're not ready. They're not trained. They're not equipped to cast out devils and 
that's where I was several years ago when manifestations started taking place in our circles. But you got to start somewhere. And uh, we began to move in this, and I remember the Lord spoke to me before all this happened, these words, and I wasn't sure what to do with it. I just thought it was kind of neat, but then I realized what I was getting myself into. The Lord said this, as Moses stood in Pharaoh's courts and said, let my people go, you will be standing before principalities and demons and commanding the same thing. I've never asked for this. But it should be a part of every spirit-filled minister's arsenals of tools is the ability by faith to address and identify issues that are caused by demons and help people to repent of those things and then cast those demons out. This is a powerful tool that God wants to restore to the body of Christ. Now, an interesting verse. So we figured some things out along the way because I was in over my head and uh, not sure how to handle some things. But one of the verses the Lord gave me was this one in Mark chapter 9, verse 29. Jesus said to his disciples when they couldn't cast out a demon, he said these words, this kind. Everybody say this kind. There's different kinds of demons. This kind the kind that don't want to come out, will not come out but by fasting and prayer. Now, you can read that verse with a religious mindset and say, okay, I'm going to fast and pray, and then God's going to give me power to cast out demons. That's not really how it works. The way it works is through fasting and prayer, we draw so close to Jesus, we become so intimate with him, his mind becomes our mind, our mind becomes his, and then we know what to do when we get into these situations. I had a demon manifest one time, and uh, um, the wife called me up. It was her husband, said, come on over here and fix my husband. I don't know if she used those words, but that's what I got when I was on the phone with her. So we drove on over there, and there was this demon manifesting, and I um, immediately went up to it. Decide I'm going to cast that thing out. And I became angry <laughs> at the demon. You know, it's okay to get angry at demons. It's very helpful if you want to get rid of them to get angry at demons. It is okay to hate the devil. It's okay to hate the works that he does. And so I commanded that demon to leave, and it wouldn't leave. Now, the Bible tells me I have authority. And so when I command something and it doesn't happen, that's a problem. And so I just, we, we wrestled with that thing for, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 minutes, and that demon would not leave. And I don't think it should take that long. And so I took a step back. I said, Lord, what's the problem here? And he brought this verse to my attention. He said, you're trying to cast out a ruling demon. And he said, surrounding this ruling demon is underlying minions. You're going to have to get rid of them first because they're protecting the ruling demon. The word he gave me was alpha. As in a wolf pack, there's an alpha. And the rest of the pack will protect that alpha wolf. And so we began to cast out, as he gave us names, we began to lead the person through repentance and uh, of certain sins. And every time we did... We could speak to the, every time the person repented, we could speak to the demon and the demon would leave. And I learned something. Repentance is powerful. It's a major part of the tool of a believer if you're going to cast out demons. And so um, we spent uh, several hours casting out these underlying minions. And once they were gone, it was really easy to get rid of the rolling prince. That was there. And so there's different kinds of demons. Now, the other thing that I want to say uh, concerning the casting out of demons, Jesus said it was a miracle. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 39, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, Hey, there's this man that's casting out demons, and we don't think he should be doing that because he doesn't go to our church. <laughs> 
I'm using some of my own wording here, but that's kind of the way they were thinking. He's not a part of us. And Jesus said, forbid him not. For there's no man which will do a miracle. Notice that he calls this casting out of demons a miracle. That can speak lightly of me, for he that is not against us is, is on our part. And so the casting out of demons is a miraculous event. It's impossible to do it through natural means. Psychology will not get rid of the demon. Now, I was hoping to get at least one amen out of that. Psychological counseling and psychological drugs are a Band-Aid. I'm not telling you to throw your drugs away. I'm just telling you they're a Band-Aid. There's a deeper issue. And if we can understand that, that there's a battle in the spirit realm. And we have authority, especially if we can identify the roots and the doorways and repent of those doorways. So Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 32, and this is a real key to deliverance. It says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So a little bit about my uh, <clears throat> personal experience. Um, some years ago, I went to Africa, and we went back into a village where the moment we got there, we were holding a church service there. You could feel the oppression in that area. It was on the border of uh, Malawi and Mozambique. And there was just a heavy, heavy presence. And later on, I realized it was, there was a, a spirit of witchcraft in that area. And uh, at the end of the service, there's a man came up for prayer. He said, I'm an evangelist here. And he said, uh, I want you to pray for my wife because she needs to get saved. And so the moment he came up, I got a word of knowledge, and I said, you know, I will pray for your wife, but I'm going to pray for you first because there's a force of evil that's going to break off your life when I pray for you. And so I put my hands on him, and I just released the power of God, and he went back over about three rows of chairs. And uh, uh, as he got delivered, as the power of God touched his life, and uh, he got delivered of a demon of witchcraft. And uh, I got to questioning this. This guy said he's an evangelist. Now, back in those days, I didn't think you could be saved and have a demon. And uh, so sometime later, we're in India. So I just kind of shrugged it off, said, well, he must not have been saved either. Some, sometime later, we were in India, and a pastor's wife comes up. And uh, she says, I'm having some problems with my mind. And she says, would you pray for me? And that's usually a sign there's a problem when there's problems in the mind. And so she, uh, we began to pray for her. And all of a sudden, as I close my eyes and put my hand out to pray for her, I hear this hiss of a serpent. And I look up, and this woman's manifesting as a snake in front of me. And uh, so I had my daughter and my wife there. I said, hey, here's an opportunity for you to cast out devils. And I had them take her off into the corner and it took about two minutes to get her delivered. But my daughter, Shana, oldest daughter, Shana, had her first experience in casting out a devil. And uh, so over the years, we've seen some of this, but I would, would always shrug it off. Well, it's probably just somebody that wasn't saved. Because surely a saved person can't have a demon because I've been taught that you can't have a demon and the Holy Spirit in the same temple. Well, I was preaching in a church in uh, Kentucky here some time ago, and I got done preaching, and I had shared a story of a deliverance. And after I got done preaching, somebody came up to me and said, these guys were experts. You ever run into any experts when it comes to deliverance? Funny thing was, when I asked them, have you ever cast out devils? They No, they never had. They just had lots of opinions on it. And so there are people like that, got lots of opinions but no experience. And so the one person came up to me and said, you do understand that you should never cast a demon out of an unsaved person. I said, really? He said, yeah, you can't do that. He said, it'll just get worse if you do that. Well, Paul did over in Acts chapter uh, whatever or that damsel was following him for days on end. He did cast a demon out of an unbeliever. But I think if you're going to do that, you probably want to get him saved pretty quick. 
That might be the reason to cast a demon out of. It might be easier to get them saved. And so I got done talking with this guy, and I went over to the next guy. Now, the next guy said, hey, you do understand, though, that uh, you can't cast demons out of believers. I said, really? He said, yeah, yeah, it's impossible for a, de- for, for a believer to have a demon. So I got to think about that later. I can't cast demons out of the unsaved, and I can't cast them out of the saved. How convenient. I guess we're just out of the demon casting out business, right? Okay. Can a believer have a demon? Let me rephrase the terminology. Can a believer be demon-possessed? No. I don't think so. But a believer can have a demon. There is a difference. And so I shared the other night about how we are spirit, soul, and body. And when you get born again, your spirit man, one-third of you gets redeemed. And the Bible says the seal of the Holy Spirit is placed upon our spirit, and that area of your being is joined together with the Holy Spirit. You become one, and inside of you is formed that new man, but that's only a third of you. There's still a part of you that's being redeemed. In the area of the mind, will, and emotions, you are being redeemed. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 tells us that. This is called the sanctification process. And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you today that getting rid of demons is a part of the sanctification process. Now, how many of you here today have reached that place of perfection where you don't need any more sanctification anymore? I'm not there yet. I'm still getting delivered of stuff. But I have learned to identify in the realm of the soul. And I've learned to allow the Lord to deal with me about certain areas in my being. And when the Lord brings it to me, I find that if I bow my knee and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I don't want to be like this. I repent. That gives me authority to tell it to leave. This is part of the sanctification process of the believer. Through discipleship, the washing of the water by the word, God takes us to deeper levels of cleansing and victory over sin. Here's an interesting verse concerning this matter of whether a covenant child can have a demon in Luke chapter 13 and verse 16. Jesus here casts a demon out of a woman who had a spirit of infirmity. I wonder what a spirit of an infirmity would do to a person. Probably make them sick, right? If you want to move in healing, it's important that we learn that demons many times are behind the sicknesses. And you can actually, and I've seen situations where people have been healed, but the demon, the root issue hasn't been dealt with, and the sickness comes back. So, Jesus says these words after he's being challenged by the Pharisees. He says, ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, she was a covenant child, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. In Mark chapter 7 and verse 26, there was a a Syrophoenician woman, a Greek woman by nation. And the Bible says that he came to Jesus Or she came to Jesus and said, there's a demon in my daughter that I'm asking you to cast out. And uh, Jesus, at that point, the focus of his ministry was the Jewish people. And and, uh, so he said no to her. But she wouldn't take no for an answer. But one of the things that Jesus says here concerning deliverance, this is very important. He says here that deliverance in verse 27 is the children's bread. How many children of God have we got in here today? Part of the bread that God provides for his children is deliverance. He gives us authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. Now, one of the tricks of the devil, he does not come to you 
with a red suit and a pitchfork and horns on his head and says, here is a nice thought that I would like you to have. Most of us, if he would show up like that, we would say no. So the devil doesn't come to us as the devil. He comes to you as you. He comes to you in the first person. He puts a thought in your mind in the first person. He wants you to think it's coming from you. He wants you to think this thought has come from you. And for some of us, that thought has been there our whole lives. For some of us, that thought, I had a demon manifest one time, and it said, I've been here for 300 years and I'm not leaving. Well, I don't care how long it's been there, you're leaving anyway. And it did. But some of these things are familiar spirits that have programmed generations into a certain way of thinking. That way of thinking becomes the stronghold and gives the demon access to a person's being. So we have to learn to identify the strongholds and say, that's not God. This fear that I am feeling is not God. Brother was talking about that last night. This intimidation that I'm feeling, that's not me. That's the spirit. And when you learn to identify it, and then you separate it from yourself, and you come before the Lord and say, Lord, I don't want to be like this anymore, then he gives you authority to cast it out. I have a few minutes left here, and uh, this is in preparation, especially for our students next week. I want to talk about spiritual breaches and demonic doorways. There's 12 main ways that a demon can get into the life of a person. 12 primary ways, and I'll give you those 12 very quickly in the rest of the time that I have left here. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 2, as the bird by wandering and the swallow by flying so the curse, causeless, cannot come. And so if there's a curse in a person's life of sickness, disease, poverty, whatever it might be, maybe it's a besetting sin that has tormented you for a long time, that thing cannot come without cause. Somewhere the door was left open to that. And if you can identify that and realize that and repent of it, again, it gives you authority over it. And so I want to talk about some of these doorways. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, the Apostle Paul talking to spirit-filled believers, right? He says this, neither give place to the devil. So as believers, we can give place to the devil, and it could open up the door for demons to come into the life of a believer. Now, Uh, Number one, the number one access point for demons into a person's life is through generational iniquities. The King James uses the word visit in Exodus 20 and verse 5, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. And I like that word visit because in the Greek, it is the most accurate translation concerning uh, this thing of iniquities. Iniquities, the iniquities of your fathers. It was a demonic temptation that caused somebody in a previous generation to fall short of the glory of God. Maybe it was anger. Maybe it was unforgiveness. Maybe it was witchcraft. If you know that thing was in a previous generation, get yourself ready because that familiar spirit will come to visit you as well. Now, the reason you want to know that is because when it shows up, the word visit is key. There are some visitors that uh, you just don't want hanging around too long. This is one of them. You can tell them to leave. Oh, no, you, you're not going to do this to me. You did this to my father. You did it to my grandfather. You did it to my uncle. But you're not staying. You're a visitor. And I have authority in the name of Jesus to tell you to leave. And so generational iniquities do not have to get passed on to the next generation. But it takes 
uh, God's children to stand up and say, oh, no, you don't. The buck stops here. I'm taking responsibility of this thing in my generation. And one of the ways you take responsibility, Daniel, Nehemiah, Ezra, the book of Ezekiel, this is talked about throughout the Old Testament, and it instructs us to confess the sins of our fathers. I've confessed the sins of my fathers. Lord, I don't want to be like this. Lord, I repent. I'm so sorry that the Esh family line has grieved you in this way. I take responsibility in my generation. I don't want to be like this. Please forgive me. And when you do that and when you mean it in your heart, the chains are broken. My dad improved in his generation over the previous one. I'd like to think I'm improving on his generation, and it's not a threat to him. He was there cheering me on, and you know I'm cheering this next generation on here at Operation Metamorphosis. It includes three of my daughters. There's some things I don't get broke through in my lifetime. I'm planning on it. But if I don't get her done, you get it done. And I want to see blessings get handed off from generation to generation. You know, I was so blessed this week. There's a little Mennonite girl came up here. And the moment she stepped up here to this line, the Lord said, I want to fill her with the Holy Ghost. I said, she's too small. <laughs> Lord didn't think so. So I asked her, I said, what do you want? She says, I want more of God. And so I prayed for her, and I mean the presence of the Lord got on that little girl. And she started speaking in tongues. Imagine that. And then I went to the back last night, and her dad was back there. I said, how would you feel about that? And he started weeping. He said, you know, six months ago you were here at that youth revival, and you told me God was going to pour his spirit out on my children. I'm glad I got to come back here and watch that. See, that wasn't me doing it. That's the Holy Ghost. And it's not you casting out devils, even though the Bible says they shall cast out devils. It's the power of the Holy Ghost through you. And so we give God the credit. We give him the honor. We give him the glory. We don't rob him of his glory in case he takes the anointing from us, right? He gets the credit. Number one is generational iniquities. Number one open door. Especially in previous generations where the Ten Commandments have been violated. It opens the door to devils. Number two is bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment. Any unforgiveness towards someone else will open up the door to demons. Brothers and sisters, we have to learn to forgive. If you're a pastor, man, I can relate. There's people going to betray you. There are people going to say all manner of evil against you. You know what Jesus says when they do that? What did he tell us to do? Leap for joy, right? My wife, this was a test for my wife and I 25 years ago. When I got filled with the Holy Ghost, the church we were a part of kind of uh, gave us the left foot of the fellowship, and then they decided to take it a step further and warn everybody about us. And so they wrote all these letters and sent them out to people, and then last of all, they sent the letters to us. Imagine that. <laughs> and one day my wife gets these letters, and she comes out to my office, and she is, she hands me the letters, doesn't say a word, turns around, goes back into the house, and I notice as she's going back into the house, she is jumping up and down. I say, what manner of salutation is this? <laughs> then I read the letters. You know what I did with those letters? I took them down to the burn barrel. I said, Lord, let this be a sweet incense to you. I release it to God. I've been able to minister to some of those very people that wrote those letters. Because I've chosen to forgive. 
on forgiveness opens the door to the devil. Hatred and vengeance and anger and all kinds of stuff. Number two was bitterness. Number three, sexual sins, pornography, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, bestiality, open the doors to generational demons. Now, I want to say this. While sexual sin can be an open door, sexual sin is never a root problem. Sexual sin is always a sign that there's a lack of intimacy with the Heavenly Father. Work on receiving the Father's love. Yes, you're going to have to repent. You're going to have to cast them out, but you'll revert back to it if you don't deal with that thing inside of you that's causing you to look for love in all the wrong places. Number four, ungodly entertainment, especially in the era, area of horror and sci-fi and occultic type movies, ungodly music, video games. Be careful what you let your children play. We got too many passive daddies that are not aware of what their children are getting into on the internet. And it's become an open door for demons. And so men, I need you to rise up and be men in your home. And women, I need you to come alongside of your husbands and support them in this. Get on the same page. There should be some lines you don't cross entertainment-wise, video game-wise, music-wise. Number five is unclean and idolatrous objects. Books. I remember going home to my old older Amish home years ago. This was years ago. And we were going to stay there overnight. And uh, so my mom said, well, you can sleep in your sister's room. Well, she was a young girl at the time. And the popular thing back in those days was dream catchers. And so I go, uh, it was after dark and they didn't have the electric lights. And so I, I'm so tired, man, I just crash out. And I wake up the next morning, a dream catcher hanging on the wall there staring me in the face. You know what a dream catcher is. It's an American Indian thing. It's real popular to hang on your uh, mirror inside your vehicle or hang on a bedroom wall or something. But it is a gateway to portal to the demonic. And some of these things... We can say, well, I'm just going to pray over them and cleanse them. No, you need to get rid of them and burn them. Do what they did in Acts. And uh, so these things can open the door. Uh, objects, certain objects, certain clothes, Ouija boards, tarot cards, horoscopes. Uh, addictive practices can open the door to demons. Alcohol, tobacco, drugs, gambling, many times there's demons behind that if, if a person's addicted to these things. Spoken words, number seven, can open the door to demons. You can actually open the door for a curse to get on your children by words and things that you say about them. You say things like, well, my dad had a heart attack when he was 50, and my grandpa had a heart attack when he was a young man, and I'll probably have a heart attack by the time I hit 50 years old. You open your door to a curse. And we need to repent of those, some of the words and inner vows and wrong things that we've spoken. One of the other things that will open the door to a curse of poverty especially is uh, stealing, dishonesty, dishonest weights. The Bible has a lot to say about dishonest weights and measures, a lack of integrity, guile, broken vials, legal violations can all open the door up to a curse. And, uh, and demons. Uh, one of the areas we've had to address personally as a family is in the area of traumatic events, sometimes trauma, car accidents, even things like 
surgery or medical diagnoses or violence, rape, abuse, abortion. It opens the door to demons. Listen, folks, I just want to say this morning, if you've ever been caught up in any of this stuff, I am not here to criticize you or condemn you. I've been involved in these things. But I want you to know that if you repent, you acknowledge the truth, the Bible says you can recover yourself out of the snare. And we have seen so many people get free and get delivered over the years. And I want to just say today, there's hope in this message I'm talking to you about because it's bringing an awareness of what the problem is and how the problem got started. And if you can take ownership, there is hope for you today. Can you say amen this morning? Amen. Wrong religious beliefs, especially pagan beliefs, but even some Christian beliefs, religious ideas, can open up the door for demons. It's number 10. Number 11, the occult. Astrology, witchcraft, going to a psychic, necromancy, fortune telling, involvement in the secret societies like the Masons can all open you up to demons. Not every time that someone steps or dabbles in this, does a demon come with it? But many times they do. And so if you know that's in your background or in your past or in your family line, repent of those things to close the door. Uh, the Eastern practices. We were out on the island here a couple of years ago with a church-going couple from a Anabaptist background, and they got invited to go to the yoga session the next morning. And they said, sounds like the will of God to us. We need exercise. So they went and did yoga for a couple of hours. Do you know that those poses are demonic? Those mantras are completely 100% demonic? And they're what the Hindus use to invite spirits in? I was in the martial arts for years before I got saved and was actually an instructor. And that's one of the things I had to repent of and get delivered from. I had to get the demons of karate cast out of me. That kia that they do, that's demonic. There's a real trend among the Mennonite people and this is true in the States as well, where there's a distrust of Medicare, the medical system, and hospitals and doctors, and so we have a tendency to move towards the natural things. And I can understand that. I'm, I'm fairly, uh, I've been involved in some of those areas, but I just want to say there's a new age side to that you want to stay away from. And so guard your heart. Uh, with some of those things that come with what's known as, uh, and even in the area of psychology, I have a good friend of mine. They operate deliverance, and one of their people was uh, taking someone through deliverance and uh, cast some demons out of him and thought he was done, and he turned to leave, and as he was turning to leave, the Lord spoke to him and said, are you going to let Bud in there? And the guy said, Who's Bud? So he went back and he said, well, I guess I'll cast Bud out. So he said, in Jesus' name, Bud, come out of this man. <laughs> and the demon left. And so three days later, this person that had Bud cast out of him went back to their psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist looked at the person and said, there's something different. What happened? And the guy said, well, I had Bud cast out of me. And the psychiatrist said, no, I put Bud in there to find out what was wrong with you. That just happened in the state of Texas. I know the people it happened to. Uh-oh. 
I'm going to close this down and turn it back over to Pastor Harvey. You know the nice thing about preaching in somebody else's church is you can go in and create a stir like this morning and then just hand it back off to the pastor and he can come back and fix everything. <laughs> Brother Harvey's a good man with lots of wisdom, so he'll know exactly how to navigate this. Don't become demon-focused with what I shared this morning. Magnify the Lord. Draw close to Jesus. And in the sanctification process, he will bring things to the surface. Just had a fellow come to me last, the other night, one of our students here, so the Lord's cleaning them up, and he said, all of a sudden I just felt this rage come on me, this anger come on me. I said, you do realize that was not you. He said, yeah, I know it's not me. I want it gone. I said, amen, we're going to get rid of it. So, if these things surface, learn to recognize them. Put your finger on them. Repent of it and realize you have authority as a believer to tell it to leave. God bless you, Brother Harvey.